my name is uh, Bruce Goulart. I'm on the organizing committee for, for New Year's War. It's my pleasure to welcome Wildlife Encounters this afternoon. We have Megan and Ryan here with us. And this will be a great experience. It would not be possible without our sponsors for this event. So I'd like to thank O'Donnell's Nursery, Amato's, Sacco and Bitterford Savings, and Corbus. So please enjoy the show and the rest of the day. here today. Does that sound like something we're interested in doing today? Not only just seeing the animals, but getting to pet some of the animals? Now like I said, the only way that we're going to see all seven animals, and definitely the only way they're going to feel comfortable enough to let a lot of people pet them, is we do have to do our best to be nice and calm and quiet. And I know we're here to celebrate and I want to have a good time too, but we do have to put the animals' needs first, of course. And then if you guys have questions, we love questions. I'll answer as many as I possibly can. Now this presentation will probably be about 45 minutes long. Now I understand that some of our little ones cannot sit for 45 minutes, so if they need to go outside and just do some jumping jacks to get their wiggles out and then come back there when they're ready, that's completely fine. If you guys have to go to the bathroom, that's okay. You can go to the bathroom. But I just ask that if myself or if Riley is walking up the bleachers with an animal, that we don't want to stand up and walk down that same aisle where the animal is. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, and the last thing I'm going to say before we get started is actually directed towards the parents and the big kids. So thank you guys for coming here as well. Our standard agreement is I promise to control my animals if you control yours. You know, they're here with you and they belong to you and you know them better than I do. So I'm going to put you in charge of them, I'll stay in charge of mine, and then we should all just get along fine. Does that make sense to everyone? We're on the same page? You guys ready for the animals to come out now? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do the majority of the talking here, and Riley's going to do some of the handling here tonight. But I think we're going to start off with our one and only native species. So that means that this first animal coming out is an animal that would live in New England. They live where you live. And of course, we're in Maine, so this animal would most definitely be found prowling at night in Maine. A lot of you probably can identify this animal because we have... This guy coming out. Now who can tell me what they're looking at? What is this animal? What is it? It's a what? A possum? You are so, so close and you said it with confidence. You're just missing one letter, my friend. This is a opossum. Yes, now I'm not trying to be picky or anything like that. Possums are real life animals, except possums live in Australia. Opossums live in the Americas, and like I said, this is the Virginia opossum. It is the only marsupial mammal in North America. So that means that the girls have pouches. Now this one's a boy, so he doesn't have a pouch, but the girls will carry their babies in their pouch. And moms are only pregnant for about 29 days. And when they give birth, their babies are about the size of a pea and they give birth to about 20 babies at a time. Now when they give birth, their babies do not have fur, or arms, or legs, or eyes. They're just like boogery, smushy peas that come out of mom. And now, those babies, which are technically embryos, have to find their way into mom's pouch. And mom can hold up to 13 babies in her pouch, and just 13. 
So the first 13 that make it in the pouch are probably going to be the ones that survive. And they stay in mom's pouch and they grow and they grow and they grow. And then they finally say, I am too cramped to be in this pouch. I need to get out. And all the babies come out of the pouch and climb onto mom's back. And she can carry 13 babies on her back. Now, if she's trucking along in your backyard and she's looking for food, and one of the babies falls off, do you think mom stops and gets up and picks her baby up? What do you guys think? Will mom stop for that baby that fell off? No, she won't. She'll just keep on moving. She'll go, whew, what a relief. I just lost some weight and she can run away faster. I know, they're, they're not the best parents in the world, but they could be worse. Now their greatest sense is their sense of smell. And opossums are actually really, really good to have in our yards as long as we don't have horses and as long as we don't have chickens. These animals, they're scavengers. So not only will they eat, they'll eat bugs, especially ticks. They're one of the biggest tick predators in North America. Yeah, that's really good, right? It is said that one year they will consume between three to 5,000 ticks, just one opossum. They'll also eat fruits and nuts and berries. If your garbage is left out, they'll happily dig through that. If you have a garden, they might dig in that as well. They're scavenger animals. Now, why would we might not want to have opossums in our backyards if we have chickens? Does anybody know why? Why? You, you'll eat, they'll eat the chickens? They might, like a small chicken, they might try to eat. Typically they go for the eggs though, because the eggs can't run away and the eggs can't fight back. But a mama chicken can, and mama chickens are really good, typically at protecting their babies. So that's one reason why. Another reason why is chickens eat ticks and bugs too. So we don't want them to compete for food. So those are why chickens and opossums might not get along. Does anybody know why if you have horses, it might not be the best idea to have opossums roaming through your horse paddock. Does anybody want to know? Yes. Yeah, they could. The, the horses could get scared. That is absolutely correct. The opossum could get scared. That is correct as well. But mainly the reason why is when opossums wander around, they eat and they poop. And their poop, if the horses accidentally congest some of that poop or maybe eats a piece of grass that their poop was once on, they could contract a disease called equine encephalitis. Opossums are a large carrier of that. Now, if this animal were to get scared in their backyard, what are they going to do? What are opossums going to do if they're really, really scared? Oh, yes, over here. They're gonna play dead, that is exactly correct. So what's gonna happen? is that his muscles are going to get really, really stiff and he's going to fall over. He's pretty much just going to pass out. The eyes are going to roll to the back of his head. His tongue is going to stick out of his mouth and from his bum, this booger mucus comes out that makes it smell like rotting flesh. It smells awful. I always get someone who's like, can you demonstrate that? No. You, like, this room would be completely cleared and you would not come back till next um, New Year. Like, it's, it's horrible smelling. And, you know, can you... Would, would you want to eat something that smells that terrible? If your mom puts food on that dinner table and it smells that bad, who's going to want to eat it? Not, not a lot of people. And sometimes animals are the same way too. They're gonna smell and they're gonna be like, oh, oh yeah, he's been dead for a really long time. I'm not eating that. So that's how these animals defend themselves. Now, probably the most common question I get at wildlife encounters is where do we get our animals? Now, every animal is an individual. They all have their individual stories. But I just want to let you guys all know that at wildlife encounters, we do not go out in nature and capture any animals from the wild. We do believe that animals born wild and free should stay and live wild and free. With that being said, he is one of three animals that actually was born in nature. And one night he was in mom's pouch. Mom was out at night, she was eating, and mom came across the road, and mom didn't know that she was supposed to stop and look both ways before she crossed that road. And mom got hit by a car. And mom, unfortunately, did not survive that accident. But either the person that accidentally hit mom, or maybe someone just driving along the road saw mom in the road. 
And what they did is they stopped and they checked mom's pouch and they saw that mom had babies in her pouch and they called a wildlife rehabber to come out and care for those babies. Now every single one of his brothers and sisters were able to be released back into nature, but unfortunately this young man did sustain an injury that makes him unable to live in nature. Some of you might have picked up on that, some of you not so much, but I'm going to give you a hint as to why he can't live in nature. And that hint is, well this young man, he is about six months old, and his name is Legolas. Because when he got injured, his leg was so badly injured that we had to surgically remove it. So he is missing one leg, and Riley's kind of showing that off right now. He has a little stump right there. So he can move, he can crawl, he can run, but he has a really difficult time climbing trees. And if he can't climb a tree in nature, then he cannot survive and live in nature. So that is my friend Legolas the Opossum. If you feel comfortable and if Legolas is feeling like he's having a good day, if you want to walk around, I'm sure some people would love to see him up close. But when Riley or myself walks around with the animals, we're not going to reach out and pet the animals, okay? The petting animals will come out at the end. And my friends on the bleachers, if you guys want to stay there, that's fine. If some of you want to actually come here and sit on the ground and get a little closer, that's okay too. But our stopping line is going to be the red line, okay? If you want to stay there, perfectly fine. If you want to come a little closer, come on over. Now, any questions about the opossum? Anything that we're wondering about my friend here? Anything we want to know about? Yes. Yes. They, I mean, they do. They kind of have that cute little nose and those long whiskers. Um, they're very cat-like, a lot of people would say. Can they hang by their tails? Wonderful. Their tails are prehensile, so he can fully support his weight with his tail. He can hang from his tail. He does not sleep hanging from his tail though. That is one thing that Ice Age got wrong that does not happen. If he tried to do that and he fell asleep, his muscles would relax and he'd fall right out of the tree and hit his head. So he can hang from it, but he does not sleep hanging from it. Wonderful questions. Any others before we move on to our next animal? Okay, wonderful. Why don't we all say bye-bye to the opossum. Bye-bye! He did such a good job. He's one of our youngest ambassador animals and he's doing a fabulous job at Wildlife Encounters. So, let's see, our next options are, and I'm going to let you guys kind of vote and decide what type of animal we want to see next. We can see a scaly animal next, we can see a slimy animal next, or we can see a feathery animal next. So, I'm going to let you guys think of what you want to see next. Again, I'm going to remind you, options are scaly slimy, and feathery. So if you want to see a scaly animal next, raise your hands. Who's voting for scaly? Okay, hands down. Who's voting for slimy? Okay, that got a good, good amount of hands. All right, hands down. And who wants feathery next? I think, I, think, I, I don't know, I think slimy won that one. Why don't you go ahead and bring out our slimy friend. Now, I just have to warn us that this animal coming out next, he's highly poisonous. We have a poisonous animal coming out next, and that animal is, bring him on out, Riley. This guy. Now, what do you think he is? Is he a frog or is he a toad? Oh, you guys are right. This is a toad. That is correct. In nature, frogs are not poisonous. Only toads can be poisonous. Now I know someone out there is thinking, hey Amber Lady, what about the poisonous tree frog? What about that poison dart frog? Well, they're technically not poisonous because they eat venomous ants. And then they use that venom and recycle it and secrete it through their poise. Pores. A poisonous animal produces its own poison. So if I take a poisonous dart frog, remove it from where it lives, it will no longer eat those ants and it will no longer have that poison. So it's not truly technically poisonous, 
Only toads can be poisonous, and this is what we call the cane toad. It also goes by the marine toad. Its scientific name is just fun to say, so I'm going to share it with you. The scientific name of this animal is called Bufo Moranus. And then one more nickname that this animal goes by, some of our older folks might recognize this, is the party toad. Now the reason why it's called the cane, to see he's like, yeah, that's the one that I, <laughs> that's that one. So the reason why they're called the cane toad is because a long time ago, in Australia, people were farming sugar cane, or just sugar. And humans, we aren't the only animals that like sugar. There's a really big beetle that likes sugar too. And these farmers were growing their food and the beetles kept eating the sugar. Now, do you think that made the farmers happy? No, they worked really hard to grow the sugar and then the bugs just kept eating it. That made them really grumpy. They wanted to get rid of those bugs. So what they could do is either one, they could go out at night when the bugs were asleep and hand pick off every single one of those beetles. That doesn't sound like fun. They could spray a bunch of chemicals to kill those beetles, but then that gets on our food, so that might not be a good idea. So what they decided to do was ship from South America, where the cane toad naturally lives. They shipped 103 cane toads from South America and brought them over to Australia and released them in those crops. Now these bugs are like, oh my gosh, there's a giant toad. It's gonna eat us all, run! So what the bugs did is they just climbed up the plant. So now the bugs are up here and the toads are down here. And the bugs are like, nanner, 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 you can't get me. Because toads aren't really good jumpers or climbers. That's the frog that's really good at those things. So now this toad is stuck in these crops where they don't get any food. And that doesn't make the toad happy. So that's when they decided to leave the crops and start going into our backyards and our schools and our, and our in our parks. And like I said, this animal is poisonous. So everywhere this toad went, the natural wildlife was like, hey, look, something new, I'm gonna eat it. You think that went well though? No, there are over 35 different toxins in this toad's poison. And if I, let's say I just lick the toad, because some animals might be curious, they might just lick it, they're gonna taste them and go, he tastes awful. The poison does not taste good. But if it's an animal that I can't taste, they might just swallow that toad. And then their tummy is gonna feel really, really upset. And then they're just gonna start throwing up everywhere. And as long as they can throw up that toad in five minutes, they'll be okay. But some animals can't even throw up. So what happens if that animal can't throw up the toad? Well, then it's, yeah, then it's game over for that animal. That's exactly what happened to bays and bays of saltwater crocodiles in Australia. Those massive, man-eating, 25-foot getting crocodiles, bays and bays of them got wiped out just because they were eating a toad. So it's not always the big, scary animals that can cause a big problem. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, Megan, why are you letting Riley touch the poisonous toad? Well, I'm not touching it. <laughs> and they're, actually, it is completely safe for us to interact with these animals. They only become dangerous when they secrete their poison. And I know that he's not secreting his poison because he's not feeling threatened. On his back, he has two poison glands. They're called parotid glands, and they are right here. One's right here, one's right there. They look like big, giant football pad shoulders. So. He makes his poison and it looks like he's sweating milk. So did it look like he's sweating milk? No, but it is safe for us to interact with him. And Riley will pick up the poisonous toad and she'll walk around so you guys can get a good view of him. But for those of you who've gone into your backyards and caught frogs and toads, I'm sure you know that when you pick them up, they start to pee everywhere. So Riley has a special toad diaper that she's going to cover his behind and hopefully nobody's gonna get peed on today. The friends on the edges and the front line, yes, yeah, splash zone, but we'll see how this goes. So any questions about my friend, the cane toad? Anything that we're wondering? Yes, my friend. Is there different colors of the cane toad? Typically, no, they're typically that color. Some of them are a couple shades lighter, a couple shades darker, but you're not gonna find a purple cane toad. You're not gonna find a blue cane toad. They're normally always the sandy brown color. Wonderful question. What's your question? Sure. 
So when he was on the table, why wasn't he jumping everywhere? Yeah, because he's a toad. And toads kind of just like to sit there and blend in and hide. And nobody was scaring him, so he didn't have to run around and jump away to get safe. So that was a very good question. How big can they get? That is a fabulous question. The cane toad is the world's largest species of toad. So he can get three times larger than he is right now. So theoretically, they can't get to be about this big. They are a very, very large species of toad. It's a wonderful question. Some frogs can stick out their tongues very far, yes. Some toads can as well, but not really this guy. He kind of has like a really fat, thick tongue. He doesn't shoot it very far. And he eats, he'll eat small rodents, small birds when he gets big, um, bugs as well. Wonderful question. <coughs> Let's see. You can be the last question about my friend, Mr. Toad, as Riley goes ahead and puts him away. So a lot of species of frogs and toads, if they feel scared, they puff themselves up to look big. That is exactly correct. Now he does that. He does that too, but he's just normally that big. So good job knowing that fact about frogs and toads, but I'm going to bring out our next ambassador animal. And I'm just going to be honest, she's, she's been in her car seat for some time. You know, it's about an hour drive from wildlife encounters to where we are right now, and she's kind of banging on her cage. And what I think she's trying to tell me is that she has to go potty. So these are living animals, so they are going to move. They're going to make noises. They're gonna, they're gonna go potty, they're gonna fart, they're gonna burp, they're gonna do all kinds of crazy stuff because they're living animals. And I wanna make sure that we're all gonna be okay if I bring up this next animal and she goes to the bathroom. No one's gonna panic. No one's gonna freak out. We're gonna be okay if she does that. Yeah. We all know that what eats poops, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna bring her out. Come here, my friend. Step up, please. Thank you. Now, everyone, this is my friend, Sophie. And can you all say hi, Sophie? Hi, Sophie. Now, Sophie is a very, very smart bird, and she is what we call the blue and gold macaw. Now, the reason why, that's correct, you are a blue and gold macaw, good job. Now, the reason why I wanted you all to say hello to her is because, like I said, she's really, really smart. She is supposed to be as smart as a three-year-old person. So, Sophie knows her own name. And she likes it when everyone's looking at her. She likes to be greeted. So that's why I wanted you all to say hello to my friend. Now, because they are so smart, they know that in nature, it is more safe for them to live in a big group of birds than to live by themselves. And does anybody know what a big group of birds is called, by the way? And go ahead and say it. What's it called, A? Eh? It's called a flock. That is correct, yes. Now, when they live in that, thank you, when they live in that flock, every bird will have a job to do. Sometimes it's the bird's job to stay on. Sorry, it's Bluetooth connected, so sometimes if I move just the wrong way, the connection breaks. So it's being a little funny today, so I apologize about that. So these animals, when they're in their flock, every bird will have a job to do. Sometimes it's the bird's job to be on lookout duty. And that's when they're high above their flock, looking for danger. And let's say Sophie has that job of being on lookout duty. What is she going to do if she actually spots danger in the South American rainforest? What is she going to do in the purple? What is she going to do? She's going to make a noise. Yes, yeah, she's going to scream. And she's going to call. And she's going to let all of her friends in the flock know that there's danger out there. And then once she has the attention of her entire flock, that's when they're going to fly away to safety. So that's one job, lookout duty. Another job is for them to just go on lunch break and eat. And what do these birds eat, by the way? Does anybody know? Do they eat plants? 
or do they eat animals? What do you think? You think they eat bananas? Yeah, she likes bananas. She's not gonna turn down a banana. She's so, what is a banana? Is it a plant or an animal? It's a plant, yes. You know what kind of plant? Well, don't, don't overthink this. Yes, it's a fruit. Yes, that is correct. So these animals specialize in eating, eating seeds and fruits and nuts. That is the main thing that they eat, seeds and fruits and nuts. Now, sometimes those seeds are protected by something hard. They're protected by a shell. So she, these birds, have to find a way to open that shell. She has to crack it. So who thinks she uses her super strong hands to crack open that shell? No, she doesn't have hands anymore. Her hands are now her wings. So who thinks she uses her funny feet to crack open those shells? No, she stands on her feet. So what does she use? Her, you guys can say it, her, her beak. She uses her beak, that is correct. Her beak is most definitely the strongest part of her body. She can hang it completely from her beak. She's strong enough to crack open a coconut with her beak. And for the older kids here, you'll understand this. She can exert a pressure of 300 PSI with her beak. So that means, because it took me a while to understand PSI, that means if Riley were to lay on the floor and a 300 pound person were to stand on her chest, that is the pressure that she will feel, the same as the pressure Sophie can exert with her beak. So who wants to be stood on by a 300 pound person? Who? Yeah, not me, but her beak can cause that same amount of force. So it is incredibly strong, that beak. So sometimes in the flock, these birds are on lookout duty. Sometimes they eat, and then sometimes they raise the babies, of course. The moms stand guard over their nest and protect their babies, and moms do not fly around eating when they are on their nest. They don't want to leave their eggs. So it's the daddy birds who fly around and eat the seeds and the fruits and the nuts. And then the daddy birds fly back to the mommy birds. They go, here you go, honey, I'm home. I brought you back your food. Open up your mouth. Blech. And he will regurgitate his food right into mommy bird's mouth. And he does that to all of his babies once they hatch too. Because the babies aren't strong enough to fly around the rainforest yet. So dad will regurgitate food to every single one of his baby bird's mouth. Can you imagine if that's how your dad's fed you tonight? No. Yeah, I know. He's like, no, that's gross. And for us it is. It's crazy. It's a little weird. But for birds, that's how they say, I care about you. I want to make sure you have some food, so why don't you go ahead and have some of mine. Now, do you have a question about my friend Sophie here? Why is she making noises to tell them? Why is she making no noise right now? All the animals, they're napping. That's what they're doing. They're, not, they're asleep. They're all sleeping on the job. Yeah, I know it's crazy. And they like being here and being in front of people, so they're patiently waiting their turn until they come out. But some of them might make noise. Some of them are napping. You know, it's just kind of the animals that I brought here today. I brought the quiet ones because I didn't want to deal with the long drive with loud ones. I'm just going to be honest here. But that was a good question. And actually the most common question that I get about this type of animal is can she talk? What does she say? And can I make her talk right now? Technically, like I said, she's very smart, so some of her noises do sound like our words. Sophie is a very good copier. She's very good at mimicking, but she doesn't technically talk. And the reason why I say that is because she does not understand what she's saying. She does not pick the right word to communicate her message. She just simply repeats stuff. And she will not mimic right now. She's a very young bird. She's only about 28 years old. And that is very young because she can theoretically live to be about 85 or 90 years old. So she does not like to mimic in front of strangers. She's kind of a little shy, this little girl right here is. But typically when I put her to bed and I shut her light off and I go, all right, good night, Sophie. Like any normal person, I talk to my birds. I'm like, good night, Sophie. I'll see you tomorrow morning. She will then for the next five to 10 minutes go, hello, hello, Sophie. Who's a good girl, Sophie? Who's a pretty bird, Sophie? 
Sophie no bye. Who is a good girl, Sophie? Because so many people have gone up to her and have said those things to her, she has learned to repeat them back to us. So she can mimic, but she can't technically talk. Any other questions about Sophie, the beautiful blue and gold macaw? What's your question? Because there are so many people here. And another thing about Sophie is she hates men. So she probably won't mimic in front of them. I'm sorry, gentlemen, I apologize. I mean, the owner of Wildlife Encounters, you know, he, he's a gentleman. He works with all the birds, not Sophie. He tries to bite her, and it doesn't make for good production or good presentation. And birds, because they're so smart, you know, they have their favorite foods and they have their favorite toys, and then they have their favorite people to hang out with, and they have their not-so-favorite people to hang out with, because they're just that smart, they can pick their favorites. There's a reason why Riley's standing all the way back there. Sophie doesn't like Riley. <laughs> I've, been working with Riley. I've been working with Sophie for about four years now, and I have been bit many times until she has learned to finally trust me. And even then, she has her days where she's like, I am not working today. You will not take me today. And she lets me know that by using her beak. But clearly she is here today, and she is feeling quite comfortable today, so she's having a good day. Um, any final questions? OK, lots of questions. You guys have asked up quite a few. I don't think you've asked a question yet, so I'll answer yours, and then we're going to see another animal. Why is she not flying? Fantastic question. Again, that goes back to she's not scared. She has the ability to fly. We don't trim her wings. It's just like I said, she knows me and she trusts me and she I give her food. <laughs> but if she flies to out there where all the, the scary men are, she doesn't want to do that. She would much rather stay here with me and she knows that I'm going to protect her no matter what. But you know, that guy is weird color orange. Someone else has a beard. It's just weird. So she would much rather prefer to stay here with me where she knows that she is safe. But if some person charges me, then she's going to be like, oh yeah, I'm out of here. Then she'll fly away. But as long as you guys are good, she's going to be good. So fabulous questions, and I think Sophie did a wonderful job. So can we all say bye-bye to Sophie? Bye-bye, Sophie. Good girl. Did such a good job. And for that, you get a walnut in your car seat. Come here, one, two, three, perch. Thank you very much. Turn the booty around, get those tail feathers in. Okay, good job. Oh, all right, you wanna bring out the monster next? Okay, so Riley's going to go ahead and bring out what we call the monster. He is our first reptile of tonight's presentation. And he, he does get that name for a reason. Why don't you go ahead and bring him out and put him on the table for us. Here he is. This is what we call the giant black and white Argentine tegu. And it's a really long, complicated name, so most people just call them tegus for short. But from that really long name, we can learn a, a lot about them. The first part of that really long name is giant, which tells us that this animal is the largest South American lizard. Black and white, of course, describes its beautiful beaded scale pattern. There are only three reptiles on this planet that have a beaded scale pattern. Argentine, of course, describes the area in which South America they typically live. And then tegu is the type of lizard that they are. And actually, when I was getting him ready to come here for this evening's presentation, I noticed that he was shedding. So I helped him out and I pulled some of his skin off his back. So this is his skin. Now I did not hurt Monster Man by removing his skin. About every two to three weeks, he will shed his old skin. And that is because reptiles never stop growing. You can see Riley is pulling some off his tail right now. And does it look like he cares? No, he's like, whatever, that's fine. Do whatever you gotta do. So this 
And what Riley has is some of his skin. Like I said, reptiles never stop growing. As long as they have food, they will continue to grow. Now granted, when they get older, they of course do not grow as much. It might only be a centimeter a year, but they still technically grow. So they always grow new skin. And how about us? Guys, do we grow new skin? Do we shed our skin? No, yes we do. Every day we shed thousands and thousands of skin cells. Except ours come off a cell at a time. We don't slough off these big patches like the reptiles do. Ours comes off a little bit every time. But we do shed our skin. That's what all that dust underneath your bed is. Old skin. Yes, kind of, and, and dirt and dander and all kinds of gross stuff. So lesson of this is clean up the events. Now these animals, for reptiles, they are kind of special in what they eat. They not only eat animals, so he will eat fish, small rodents, birds, smaller lizards, snails, bugs when he's really young, but they will also eat plants. They will also eat fruits, nuts, and berries as well. So they are an omnivore, and most reptiles are not. So he's very special because he does eat both foods, which is really good. If he wakes up one day and looks around the rainforest and goes, oh my gosh, all of the animals ran away. Is he still gonna be able to survive? Yes, because he could eat plants. Or what if he woke up and went, oh my gosh, all the plants ran away. Would he still be able to survive? Yes, because then he just eats the animal. So by being an omnivore, it gives him the most high chance of survival, that they are the least picky eaters, and that makes them able to survive much better. Now, sometimes these animals like to hang out by the water and lay and bask in the sun, as I'm sure we all love to do. And sometimes when they're napping, other animals might look at Monster and go, you know what? He looks a little tasty. So let's say I am his predator, and I'm sneaking up on the tegu, and I'm being really, really quiet, and he doesn't see me at all. And then out of the corner of his eye, because his eyes are on the side of his head, so he can see really, really well behind him and all around him, he spots me. What he's going to do is he's going to take off sprinting. And these animals can run about 15 miles an hour but for only a couple hundred feet, and then they have to take a nap. They're just sprinters, they're not long distance runners. So hopefully, in that couple hundred feet, he has been able to shove himself in a hole, and he's protected his head and his belly, but his tail sticks out of that hole. So I catch up to him, and I go, ha ha ha, silly Tegu, you left your tail out, and I chop down on his tail. Do I get Tegu dinner tonight? I have his tail. I have him. What do you guys think? Do I get Tegu dinner? No. No? Why not? I have his tail. Why? His tail detaches. His tail detaches? What? Yeah. I mean, you're correct. But that's still kind of crazy to think about. These animals can what is called autotomize their tail. They can completely break it off. Now, there's no blood squirting everywhere. It does not hurt the Tegu. But the crazy part, it, you're freaking out some people by pulling off his skin. I hope we know that, right? Some people are see like she's leaving because you're pulling off his skin. You're freaking out so much. They, what we were talking about, we were talking about tails. Okay. So it does not hurt the lizard to lose its tail. But the crazy part is that once his tail detaches, it still continues to wiggle and move. So that predator is so focused on controlling just the tail that it might not see him come out of that burrow and run somewhere else. They might not see him come out of that burrow and slip into the water. So that is Monster, the giant black and white Argentine Tegu. Riley will walk around with Monster and you will be able to see him up close. And you will get a really, really, really good view hold on, of his boy parts. His monster's a boy. Now parents don't freak out. What I'm referring to are his big cheeks right here, are his jowls. Only the boys have these big chunky cheeks right here. The female tegus have kind of the slender faces. But the boys have these big jowls. It makes them look big and tough and scary. So the monster will walk around and I'll answer questions about monster the Argentine tegu. Does his tail grow back? 
fabulous question. Out of the lizards that can break off their tails, only 10% of them can grow them back. The tegu is one of those 10%. But just because they can does not mean they will. It does take a lot of energy to regrow a body part. And it takes a very, very long time. And when it grows back, it does not grow back in that beautiful black and white pattern that actually grows back kind of hard and pinkish. It's like a big scar that grows back. So they can, but they, know they don't always. I hope that answers your question. They can, but mostly they don't. <laughs> Some little pet lizards do it too. Oh yeah, his monster sticking out his tongue at you guys. Do you know what he's doing with his tongue? Is he being rude? What is he doing with his tongue? He's smelling with his tongue. That is correct. Now who can smell better, Monster or Riley? Now, I'm not talking about like in the ooh, smell. I'm talking about like with their nose. Yeah, Monster can smell better. He can smell about three times better than any person with their tongue. So they're very, very good at smelling. And that, and their tongue is so long, which helps them smell really well too. Good questions. Okay, this is my question group over here. So what's your question? Did he lose his tail? It, did his tail already break off? Technic monster? Yes. Um, we typically don't share the story, but because you asked, I will go ahead. Monster did not always live at wildlife encounters. If monster came to wildlife encounters and he was making me nervous. He was very <laughs> sick when he came to wildlife encounters and he had an infection in his tail. So what they, what Monster did, what his body did, was walled off the infection to his tail. So he started to get better but his tail started to die. So one day I picked him up and I noticed that his tail felt funny, it smelled funny, it was moving funny and we noticed that rushed into the vet, we realized what happened, and that day we did surgically remove his tail. Um, we probably could have just let it go, and it probably would have fallen off on itself, but we decided to help him out and surgically remove it by ourselves. So he did lose a portion of his tail, but he's doing fantastically well now, and he is in fact starting to regrow it. It just takes a very, very, very long time to do so. So that's why it's a little bit shorter. He's not poisonous. No, reptiles can be venomous, not poisonous. But he's not venomous. But he does have a really big mouth. So we can't touch the animal, but can we touch his skin? You want to pet his dead skin? Do, 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 yeah, that actually no. Okay, when I read, when I word it like that, it sounds weird. Um, I can leave his skin out, and at the end of the presentation, if you guys want, you can come up and pet it. But right now, we're going to bring out our last animal of the formal presentation. So Monster's going to go ahead and go back into his car seat. I'm going to clean up his dead skin. Thanks, buddy, for leaving us a good present here. I'm going to take that back. Okay. Now, this last animal... I mean, he's, he's just a really cool animal, and I really want to get the opportunity to share him with you guys. But this animal, sometimes he can get a little nervous, or sometimes he can get a little too excited. And things that might make him a little nervous are people getting up and moving. Are those little party noise maker thingies. So we can't blow any of those. If you have any food in the front row, hide it, or he's going to try to eat it and we're gonna have to stay in our seats. <laughs> Mom's like, go oh, hide the goldfish. <laughs> you think I'm joking, but you will see it. You'd be like, hey, I want some goldfish, and he's not a really good share. So, are we good? Are, are we gonna stay in our seats? Yeah. Are the little ones on the floor here gonna stay in our seats? Yeah. We're not gonna stand up and run around? I hope so, because if you could, you could startle him, and then I go to the hospital, and that's just not how I wanna spend my New Year's Eve. But he's really, really cool as long as we're nice and calm and we're nice and quiet, okay? And another fair warning, remember how I said he's not good at sharing? Sometimes 
he thinks this microphone's his. And sometimes he tries to steal my microphone. And if that happens, well, I don't want him to steal it, so I might just have to take it off. But I promise I do talk really loud. You guys still will be able to hear me. But if you see me take it off, that's why. He just thinks it's the fun game of trying to steal Megan's microphone. So the animal coming out. Coming out, my friend. We still want to be nice and quiet for him. He's working his way out. We have this guy right here. Now, a few of you have already heard you guess, and you're looking at him and you're saying, oh, he's an anteater. That's a good guess, but that's not what he is. Does anybody have another guess of what this animal is? Let's see in the purple. A ring-tailed lemur, that is a wonderful, wonderful guess, but that's not what he is. That's a good guess, though. All right, and how about, yeah, you wanna take, wanna go for it? It's a platypus, okay. No. <laughs> platypus are native to Australia. Um, not this animal, they are native to South America. This animal is what we call a Kawachi Mundi. This is what we call a Kawachi Mundi. Now that is kind of a silly name. Uh, the more common nickname for this animal is Rainforest Raccoon. Because they live in the South American rainforest and they are members of the raccoon family. Hi, thank you. And like your raccoons, they, like I said, they're very intelligent. They like to go into places that they should not. They should like to, they like to explore things that they should not. They want to have everything to themselves. There we go, you're gonna stay right there. But what makes this raccoon different from all other raccoons is several things. First is when they sleep. We have raccoons that live in New England. When do they sleep? Or when do we see them? We see them at night. So that means they are nocturnal. nocturnal, yes. He is not nocturnal. He is the opposite of nocturnal. He sleeps at night and he's active during the day just like us. He's the only member of the raccoon family that has that sleep pattern. Who knows that fancy word? Opposite of nocturnal is Diurnal is correct. He's the only diurnal member of the raccoon family. And the other special thing about this raccoon that makes him different from all others are their teeth. They have the longest, sharpest, and most powerful canine teeth. His canine teeth are so big that they actually hang out of his snout. His canine teeth are so big that he can pierce the skulls of baby Gariel that live in the South American rainforest. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna give you that, thank you. His, I know, paper towel, so fun. His canine teeth are so long and powerful that not this one, but this one's roommate has had the lovely pleasure of tasting my bones before. That is how powerful and long and strong <laughs> their teeth are. And as you can see, like I said, the Kuatis are very curious animals. If you live in South America and you leave a window open, they're gonna go in and eat your food. If you leave your garbage out, they're gonna eat that. If you have a hammock, well then they're gonna play in it. They're very, very curious animals. They're fabulous climbers. The females typically live in packs where the males typically live by themselves and travel throughout the rainforest. The females typically have territories. Now we are nearing the end of our presentation. I wanna make sure we all have the opportunity to pet our meat and greek animals. So I'll take a few questions about our friend, the Kuwati Mundi, before we bring out those meat and greek animals. So what is your question? No. <laughs> Those really big teeth. You know what? Just because you asked so nicely, Riley. Have my microphone. All right. Hey, buddy. They want to see you up close. You want to go parte? Okay. They're also wonderful climbers. So now we're not going to. We're not going to touch him. But you guys can see him a little bit more up close. So you can see how he balances in the trees. How he climbs the trees. Thinks I'm a tree, and Alan, shimmy, shimmy, you go. Just back up, my friend. Hi. Oh, oh, oh my God. Oh, oh, this is a family show. Oh, oh, oh. Um, he is checking. He's checking for bugs in my nose, in my mouth, and in my ears. I promise you he's never found it, but he always likes to check every time. 
about the Pilates. Yeah. Come on, buddy, that was rude. Uh -oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, why is he in the room? Why, that's just his coloration. Yeah.